Hey friends, Mike Myers here with the Song Rang for Guitar podcast, episode number 10, Brett Resnick. Now in this episode, we're going to talk about Brett's journey from going to music school, majoring in guitar, and then eventually ditching it, taking up the pedal steel, following his dreams to Nashville, and finding his way into Casey Musgraves' band. That's right, the Casey Musgraves. This is an episode you don't want to miss, so let's just jump into it. Episode number 10, Brett Resnick. Your, your story is super interesting to me because pedal steel is not like you didn't you know grow up as a kid and be like, pedal steel is what I'm going to do. Absolutely not. Not not in the family that I was <laughs> raised in. Both my parents were kind of hippies and I, I go through I went through a lot of phases the you know the typical phases as a person growing up like in music you know all the classic rock stuff I was actually a big Kiss fan growing up <laughs> <laughs> of all things <laughs> and uh, you know Metallica Pink Floyd you kind of eventually get out you know get out of that stuff and then and then I was a couple years out of high school and a buddy of mine kind of we were in a band together and he he kind of grew up listening to country music a little bit more than I did and he kind of got me into like you know the the Birds and and honestly, I was I was kind of transitioning and listening to some Bright Eyes, and I was super into them. And they actually had pedal steel in their stuff. I think Mike Mogus was a steel player and producer extraordinaire. And so I just wanted to just get a little, like, just be able to play it at a level where I could suit a song. That was really my only goal. So you guitar was like your like yeah. the instrument that you was your intro to music and just like, okay, this is the thing to communicate like songs. And it's interesting yeah. hearing you talk about like, I feel like everybody goes mm -hmm. through that phase when you're at a point where it's like, it's classic rock because you're like, that's rock and roll. But then eventually it's like you discover other things and it's almost like that's your launching point into rock. It, yeah, exactly. It's just one of those things that you, you hope you hope you kind of go through it and you don't get stuck in just one area, you know. Yeah. You know, I think forget you know when I was a guitar, when I was like a full blown guitar player, you know, it was like David Gilmore, Jimmy Page. Then eventually it turned into like Chet Atkins and Lenny Bro, you know, and some kind of more highbrow West Montgomery kind of a uh, little slicker stuff, you know. And and bright eyes and everything on like Saddle Creek Records, like mm -hmm. uh, Ray Lo Kiley, like that. All of that was like fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, when I was kind of growing up in, uh, like, the Topeka, Kansas, you know, Lawrence, Kansas was just, like, 25 miles away, so, you know, yeah. you, I, anytime one of those bands came through was Ryle Kiley, Death Cab for Cutie, Bright Eyes, you name it, I'd always go up with some friends and watch them play, and they were, they were some of the greatest shows that I remember going to, you know, at that time. I'm trying to think of that. There's a band I grew up listening to, the Get Up Kids. I feel like they're from yeah, Kansas. they're out of Kansas City, Lawrence. Yeah, Harry. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think um, one of them actually went on to open up a coffee shop there that's still really good. I think it's the Bourgeois Pig in Lawrence, Kansas. It's still I actually try to stop in when I'm visiting my folks back in back in Kansas. Oh, that's awesome. So you you get into bands, you said, and you start kind of like developing. And so pedal steel, it was just like, oh, this was like. Oh, to just accent some things and maybe it, it'll exactly. add some cool elements into the song. Yeah, exactly. I, I, somewhere floating around, I have my one of my first recordings. Probably the first recording was probably two days after I got the instrument. And the song me and my buddy had written, it had a lot of minor seven flat five chords and <laughs> others. It was like, probably not the best steel song you want to be. It's definitely not, not together again or anything like that, you know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I just it's funny going back and like listening to it, it's just like the steel is just like so it's just so out of tune but at the time we were all just stoked because just hearing those strings bend it's just like there's nothing like it you know but that seems like a cool intro to just like a little bit of like self-education of the instrument and it's like the oh, best yeah. way to learn how to use it in the nicest way is just fucking do it and mm -hmm. just figure out what what's going to happen yeah my buddy who i was in a band with his name's willie but he was actually once I told him, I was like, man, I really want to play pedal steel. He, he's just the best dude in the world. And he actually got on eBay and it ended up buying, spending like eight or $900 on an old Showbud Maverick for me to play in the band. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the kind of person he is, you know? That's a, that's a friend I want to have. That is yeah. like her. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so was it almost like as soon as you, you know, started messing around with pedal steel, it was like you were relearning the guitar, just different. It was just like the mapping and it was just like, it was all brand new. Yeah. Yeah. It was all brand new. I mean, like I was just at that point, 
is a steel player. I was just playing with just a thumb pick. The thought of wearing actual finger picks was still like, just never felt comfortable to me. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, when for me, when I was learning steel, cause I was still like playing like, I don't know, 70, 80% guitar most of the time. So I wasn't mm-hmm. maybe dedicating myself like I could. It was like gain a little traction, then go in the ditch for like, <laughs> you know, a few months or so. And then maybe you learn something and it kind of springs something up. And then, I end up going. I end up leaving Kansas and going to Berkeley, uh, up in Boston, Berkeley College mm-hmm. of Music. And uh, after about a year or so there, you know, I was still playing steel, just kind of on a you know on an avid enough level to keep sharp with it, I guess, you know. And after I'd just seen all these amazing musicians, guitar players, you know, just a dime a dozen, I was like, well, I gotta like, I gotta, I gotta rethink this whole thing <laughs> here, you know. And I just felt like a pretty, pretty average guitar player at that point, so. I just decided right. to go. I just kind of pushed my chips all in and just. just this is went. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, it's, and, it, that's... yeah. <laughs> and, and then I started getting all these gigs, you know, around with, you know, with Berkeley people, you know, songwriters and, and I joined the country ensemble and there at Berkeley that they have. And that, that kind of kickstarted, I would say everything. And there was another person in, in Boston who had like a weekly gig. It actually started like at an Indian restaurant. And then, and, then, <laughs> and then moved into like a, you know, a proper bar. But, you know, we, we, we play a lot of the classic material from the sixties and seventies. And that, you know, that kind of gave me a good little primer on playing the honky tonk stuff. But I feel like that was you finding necessity. Like you just look and you're like, there's so many guitar players. Like, yeah. How can I adapt to this? And it's just like, you just found something. You're like, well, this what if I just focus on this? And then suddenly everybody's like, oh, can can you do this? Can It's like the doors just then opened up more and you were like, well, maybe this is more of a viable option. Oh, totally. I mean, I kind of knew, I always kind of knew that if I could get to some level of being competent where I could just like play, just be comfortable playing any sort of music, like yeah, people are going to call you and you're going to, and you're going to work. And, and my, and eventually my, that kind of, all played itself out to me a lot. I'm going to move to Nashville. I never, you know, I was still kind of like, man, it's like the best players in the world. I, can I, can I make it there? I don't know, yeah. but I'm going to try anyways. Cause I mean, why not? And, uh, at this point I just kind of got obsessed with all things, Nashville classic record, you know, all the classic stuff and was just trying to be ready for the, the plunge into the deep end, you know? <laughs> What, what was that like, you know, making that jump? Like, where do you, you know, because I know some people are like, I'm going to move to Nashville. And they're like, but I don't know where to start. Like, it just yeah, seems very um, confusing. I, I had had a chance to visit Nashville, or play a couple shows there just with mm-hmm. uh, some bands. I was uh, like one of the bands I was working with up in Boston. We had came and played like a house party or something like that. And I ended up meeting some people and having a good time. And I was like, yeah, I think I like the vibe in Nashville. I think this is what's going to happen. And then I think six months later, I I moved there. This is like maybe September of 2011. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I dropped out of Berkeley or whatever. And uh, and, and, uh, so I was like looking for work. And I some some person had mentioned that I have a steel player. This is like on a a Craigslist ad. (laughs) Steel player. I already have a steel player, but I need a guitar player. But I responded to in many ways, just for whatever reason. And it happened to be the person that threw the house party. And I kind of hit it off with this person. His, his name is Kel Tyson. And he just, he's like, you know what? You're going to play pedal steel for me. I know what you can do. Basically. <laughs> so. I find that interesting. So when you were in yeah. that stint of Berkeley and you were starting to adapt more to like pedal steel and you're doing that, was there a point where you were like the, the template of the school is good, but it's just not fitting for what I want to do. I have to just go and, yeah, like, it, it. It, yeah, it's kind of twofold. It's I had kind of just after I was in my fourth semester, I believe, at that point at Berkeley, and they usually want you to declare a major, and I was just kind of like I had kind of checked out because I was touring with that band that I was working with. I think they were called Visions at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, I had kind of checked out because I already was looking forward to Nashville. I was like, you know, why why, why do I want to rack up any more student loan debt? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like, I get a nice reminder about that once a month, you know. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I think at that point I was just like, I was ready to move on. It's like, I, 
if I'm going to play country music, I don't, I don't need harmony for or advanced stuff to, to really make it in Nashville. So <laughs> I, I think that's, you know, that, that's cool for people to hear because I think sometimes people are either raised where they're like, Oh, you to do that thing, you have to go to school. And yeah. they're like, well, but the idea of like, you, you can go, but you can feel it out. And then suddenly you realize, Oh, I, I just don't think this is right for me. I think I have to just jump into the area of, you know, it's not to say you can't learn, you can't do other things, go to mentors and people that are doing it well, but like to just go and start executing it and doing the thing, suddenly oh, that's the education yeah. in itself. Yeah. I mean, exactly. And you know, it's the music business. I mean, there's like, you know, if you're a musician, there's no like no path that is alike with between everyone else. You know, it's kind of like, you know, if you want to get into a band, they're not going to ask you like what, <laughs> <laughs> what your GPA was at uh, Berkeley your third semester or something, or if you pass his class, it's just kind of like, if you know you can do it, you should just go out and do it. You know, I'm not trying. We were going to give you the gig, but we saw you missed freshman <laughs> seminar a couple yeah. of times. It just really bothered me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I don't know. There, there, there's a saying that goes around. It's like, if you graduate Berkeley, then you're probably not going to get a job or something. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I think it's it's just timing for everybody, you know, at that point, my time, I mean, I feel like my time has moved on from, from me being and wanting to be in Boston, be in school to like, actually, you know, because at that point, I was probably in my mid to late 20s. I felt like I was older than everyone I was playing in a band with or whatever. And my taste had kind of moved a little bit differently. And I had kind of had a vision that I wanted to to kind of go after. And I love that because you just, you kind of knew some things, but you just kind of went for it where it's like, even when the thing wasn't clear, you were just like, ah, you know, I really got to do this thing. And you know, if I don't do this, I know it's kind of like staying here isn't right. Yeah, exactly. And and, you know, and then I think too, like my parents were always, they've always been super supportive of, they've always believed in me and have always supported me. Like, especially just like, the first six months to a year I was in Nashville to like, just keep me on my, to keep me afloat out here until I yeah. could kind of like get a little bit more acclimated in town and all that stuff, you know? So if we go with that metaphor, keeping afloat, what was that kind of like the little life raft or the little thing where it was just suddenly the first gig where you were like, picked up some traction where you were like, Oh, and then it's slowly um, built up. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, well, when I was started working with, uh, my buddy, uh, Kel Tyson, mm-hmm. he he had, he was at Belmont at that point, and so I started meeting a bunch of different Belmont people, and uh, you know, and so we we do a lot of the you know a lot of those classic gigs in, in Nashville, whether it's like a two dollar Tuesdays at Five Spots or yeah. or uh, the familiar uh, what's that New Faces Night at uh, the Basement, and just you know, just doing a bunch of other just random gigs. And I remember mm-hmm. meeting all these other great songwriters at, at that time, you know, some that have moved on and don't, don't live here anymore. And also like it, one of the first tours we went on, it was kind of like, I'm trying to think of all the people. Uh, Jordan Hole was one of the songwriters that he's moved from Nashville in recent times. But he was, an, he's amazing, amazing songwriter. And I played on his mm-hmm. first couple records. And another one was Mackenzie Scott, who's moved on. She has a project named Torres that's, done really well for her and she's she was you could kind of see her her coming in her her own so just getting a chance to like work with a lot of these songwriters just seeing them kind of come up at that point it was probably my first kind of uh just this is cool <laughs> you know, the money wasn't like amazing but you know you'd also i'd also get called for some other random sessions and things like that now is it interesting looking in as just like a musician into their songwriting process like like what are they like how are they doing that like you know just almost like you're seeing the structure of the song and where you fit in it yeah you know i usually i'd come in they'd kind of show me a a skeleton of what they're working on you know and then i might try to come up with some like you know some parts it could be an intro or could be a turnaround thing, you know, or just a riff or just try to like bring the, you know, a lot of times what I like to do is like listen to the lyrics and just try to like bring them to life on, on the steel. You know, if there's, there's uh, one song with Kel I remember doing where he talks about driving and speeding off into the night and I just make this weird unison ramp up thing. And I just try to just bring 
some some life to the to the song. That's really cool that you're looking for a lyrical like I don't know vibe and or feel. Yeah, to just give yeah. you a hint of where to go because you know some people are like, oh, do the lyrics matter? But in that instance, it's like that gave you direction of like, oh, that's the thing I need to do because it's like I could play cool things, but what's right for the song? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Going through the whole process of knowing figuring out what's right. And also like when you take fills as a pedal steel player, you know, you don't want to, you, you don't want to walk on the vocal line. You want to find that space in between when, when the singer is not singing, just try to like paint the picture of could be two notes, could be three notes, whatever it could be, you know, just mm -hmm. try to tastefully fill that space up. And a lot of times too, when I, I talk about bringing a lyric to life, you know, through the sounds of the pedal steel. But I also like, you know, if there's some cool melody stuff going on during the verse, I try to also mimic that too. Oh, that's cool. To me, that is just like, you you, you really have to focus on, and, and it's not to say that you can't play the chords, but like you have to focus on the song and taking tidbits from the melody and being like, hey, could I do a counter with that? Or could I just, you know, is there some way that I can incorporate that into my idea of a riff or something that they all kind of like flow and tie in together? Yeah, yeah, that, that's like, you know, my favorite pedal steel player, uh, his name's uh, Lloyd Green, classic Nashville guy, been on kajillion sessions, but just listen, and he, and he says the same exact stuff in his, you know, when he, any times he interviews, you know, he's like, you know, listen to the lyrics, but you, you can also hear like just how great his ears are when you, when he plays with a song, because he's always just playing off the melody and it's just so tasteful you know it always yeah. hits me in a profound way and so you know i try to bring that to life because i feel like at the end of the day what are you you're, you're playing a song with that melody so you want to try to like capture bits and pieces of that yeah and that that is it's just interesting to hear your perspective of like a session guy going in and adding a bit to a song but knowing what to look for and then from there, allowing your creative brain to be like, cool, let's let's do this. Where does this where is this going to go? That's super yeah. interesting. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And and Lloyd's also, you know, Lloyd is uh, he, he's a member of Mensa and <laughs> he's still with us, luckily, because he, he's he's a national treasure, if you ask me. But yeah, I mean, like it, it, those are the things you, you want also, like when you're playing, just like look for unique ways to play these on the instrument that maybe that are a little outside the box too. And that's something he's kind of taught me. There's, you know, use different string groupings that maybe you wouldn't normally try and try to use, try to bring the melody to life on there. Cause it's going to have a different sound, different timbre. Yeah. So, you know, that's something I always strive for. I think that's, I think that any, any person coming up playing pedal steel or what it could be guitar or whatever it is, you know, I think I always, always look for different ways to play things and unique ways. Cause you, you might just stumble upon something that will make the song. Now, I feel like everything that you've talked about prepped you. Do you feel like all of that prep? Because now you, your your gig is pretty sweet. Casey Musgraves <laughs> playing. Yeah. You know, how did that, how did that, you know, come about where you just, you know, you got a call of like, was it just like a fill in for a moment or was this over time that um, it kind of developed into something? Yeah. Well, uh, I think it was the, it was January of, 2017 i want to say and i was just you know it's usually a pretty slow time for most musicians in nashville and i had got a call from uh the band leader uh kyle ryan who uh asked me if i was doing anything i don't remember what day it was exactly the month but i was like yeah i'm, I'm free he's like you, well you want to come up and play a show in michigan with uh, with casey and us and i just thought i was subbing in because i knew they had a steel player at that at that point mm-hmm and so uh, I was like, cool. And then we had a couple of rehearsals. They they went great, super relaxed. Casey was awesome, easy easy to work with. And at that point too, they had kind of uh, it, were at the, it, they were at the very end of the touring cycle of uh, pageant material. And I think they were all kind of burned out on playing those songs. So they had played them for I don't know two years straight or something like that. And they wanted to kind of do some new life. So I, they basically gave me free reign to just be me and that's yeah. that's awesome so it, it, we we did the we did the gig up in uh up in michigan i think it was ann arbor and it yeah. was kind of surreal because it was huge theater and it was kind of a folk festival sort of vibe and uh jenny lewis was also playing on the gig she was super nice and we actually ended up going to like a bar like afterwards and having some drinks and 
And oh, damn. Just, like, I got to, yeah. So it was like, all right, this is cool. I like your play. <laughs> and I think, I think it was at that gig in Michigan. I'm pretty sure where Kyle's like, Hey, uh, you want to do uh come to Vegas with us and uh, do uh, the George, some George Strait gigs and do Kayamo cruise with, uh, you know, you want to do Red Rocks with John Prine? I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that and is so, so it, good. Yeah, at that point, I had basically learned that their their past steel their steel player had hit a hit a left, and yeah. so I guess I at that point I just kind of knew I I got the job I guess. And uh, you know, the first year we, we we there wasn't a ton of gigs the first year, but like everything we did was amazing. It was just like life altering mm-hmm. stuff that. I just never had even thought could happen. So yeah. we did Red Rocks with John Prime that year, the two shows wow. in Vegas at at uh, at their arena there. We did like a two two or so week tour with Willie Nelson. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it was just amazing thing. And I and I had actually done I had actually opened it before I had joined them. I had actually done a show playing probably the biggest show up to that point before I had played with Casey was open opening the show for Willie Nelson. We did a few with him. I was working with an artist named Luke Bell. And uh, so we, we'd done, so I had done a couple shows with, with the Willie crew at that point, but to do like mm-hmm. a two week run with them was a, a, an amazing time. And they'd, uh, we'd always come out on stage at the end of, during the gospel, we'd be in the gospel choir at the end of the Willie set. So we were up yeah. there singing with Willie. I mean, you know, getting a chance to play with John Prine, you know, before his lot, that that's huge. And then yeah. Nelson Red Rocks, that is, I don't know, it's yeah. you following your intuition of like, I think I should do this thing. And all those things are like, that's badass. That is like, yeah. it's a good th- that you just went with it. And all those things happen. That is so good. Yeah. I mean, I, I had had the chance to do some cool, amazing stuff, but it was my parents had driven up from uh, from Topeka to come see me play at Red Rocks with John Prine. And they're huge Prine fans. They're both two hippies and they both <laughs> love Prine. So it was just kind of like, it always just means the world to like have your, your folks there and be able to like, you know, see. And I mean, how know. proud they must be of you doing that. Like, you know, just yeah. watching and enjoying it just as like, as they would if they just got tickets to it, but it's even more enjoyable and special because they're like, that's our son playing in that band right now. Yeah. And just enjoying yeah. it even more. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that first year was amazing. Another funny story is we were in Los Angeles uh, during that tour with Willie Nelson. And uh, at the very end of the show, we got up for the gospel choir thing. I'm just kind of having a good time up there with the rest of my band, you know, the rest of the bandmates. And then I like, look over my left shoulder and standing next to me singing with us is Chris Christopherson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is, what is my life at this point? <laughs> It's just like, hey, what's up? And it's like, hey, Chris. That, yeah, that's so- yes, that was that was just kind of a, a welcome to the show moment sort of thing. There, that was kind of amazing. So this was all was this prior before Golden Hour? Yeah, and just like, yeah. So so that was already kick ass before, mm-hmm. and then once that you know Golden Hour kicks off, which is great out. But then when's Grant you know Grammy Award winning? Then yeah. did it Actually, seem like it yeah. just soared up even more? Exactly. So actually on that Willie tour, we we were we had kind of been experimenting playing a couple songs off that record. She was so excited about the songs. I think she wanted to just let's let's see what, what we can do to the songs yeah. uh, in a live setting. So we we started kind of workshopping a couple of those songs during the Willie tour. And then uh, I think 2018 rolled in. She had kind of finished up the record and basically when like, 2018 started, we were just off to the races. The record was done. We started that tour with the little big town in the Midland, the little big town crew was amazing. Every, you know, like those were like big kind of uh, pretty, pretty sizable arena sort of shows, little big town and kind of just transitioned in, into that world. And Casey was still like in that country crowd, you know, mm-hmm. kind of lumped in with a little big town. But later on that summer, this had been booked, I don't know, about a year or so before, but, but we had uh, agreed to do a tour opening for Harry Styles. And uh, I, I honestly, when we booked that, I don't know when it was, it was like just after the Willie tour, I think I had heard about it or something. I was like, mm-hmm. who's Harry Styles? I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but then the more I started to learn, I was like, oh yeah, the tours. And we saw like the, the, where the, all the shows were going to be at. And it's like two nights at Madison Square Garden, uh, East Coast, West Coast, all just all the huge sports arenas, you know? 
yeah. nights at the Forum in L.A. And uh, I feel like that tour really kind of completed the vision that I think she was looking for. Yeah. With that record. it, it get, That record kind of got to more people, I think, at that point that was in a little bit different kind of uh, crowd. It may have some preconceived notions about a particular style or artist. And then when they see them, they're like, oh, shit, this is this is yeah. really good. Yeah, because when we had started that tour with a little big town, the record wasn't out. It didn't come out till like March or April or something like that. And we were already three months into the tour. So I don't know if like a lot of people, I don't think that many people obviously knew or were familiar with the songs on, on that tour. We were still playing quite a bit of Golden Hour stuff, but I don't think people were, I don't think they were ready for it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they might have been ready for Pontoon or something, whatever, a little big town song. So I don't know if it was exactly like our audience at that time, but. I think once the record kind of got out and in records these days, they take, you know, it's not like unless you're Taylor Swift or something like that records take a lot of time to digest and to get to the people. And, and that's the trends I always see here in Nashville. It's like to say it was, you know, Sturgill Simpson. I remember, when, I remember when uh, Meta Modern Sounds came out, you know, it was like, this is a cool record. And then it's just like, Six months later, or whatever it is, you know, it's just like everyone's playing the record. You, you have the records where you're like, oh, you know, it's it's okay, and then you listen to it, and as you said, almost like also digesting it a little bit, and you listen to it again, you're like, oh wow. Third time, yeah. you're like, oh shit, that, that like that's really good. But it took a while for it to kind of like sit and resonate with you a little bit, but then it suddenly yeah. like opens up to like everyone seems to be listening yeah. to it. You know, I, I don't I couldn't, it's hard for me to really, like I said, the Harry Styles tour seemed kind of like a turning point. And we had done mm -hmm. a ton of, we had done a ton of like the late night spots, but I, you know, I'm trying to think if there's anything I can kind of pinpoint where it was like a certain song on the record. Cause you know, I don't know if there was like a single, you know, Butterflies was kind of a hit Space Cowboy. I mean, it's just, there, I don't know. I mean, it was. It's just not a conventional industry anymore where they're just like, oh, this was a single. This was a single. It's kind of like, I don't know, songs just kind of get released and they, they <laughs> kind of do a yeah. thing. And it's not like MTV where it's like, yeah, we put a new video out or something like back in the 90s or whatever. And the way you're describing it, it feels how I feel sometimes music is, is the slow climb. Like it's like things get better and you're moving yeah. up, but it's not like. Oh, it's it's there. It just seems like it's just a series of different steps and different things that get you to. Oh, I, I guess this is is this the top? It just seems to keep on going. It doesn't seem like there's a definite like this is the top of the top. It just seems like there's another level. Oh yeah, but then there's well, more climbing and well, another yeah. level. That, that's that's what the Harry Styles tour was. It's kind of like you you when you kind of see him play. And you see all the, the arenas are just jam packed full, like not just like full, like 360 degrees around the stage full. And yeah. even when like the lights, you know, when the lights kind of slightly go down and then you hear all the people screaming, you're like literally just like about to shatter your ears. You're like, oh, <laughs> that's the other level. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just an amazing time to be be a part of. Of that and honestly like, harry is the nicest person you could ever meet he's always just like you know he just wants to be one of the guys it seems like you know because his life's probably so crazy he's always coming to our dressing room before we go to the stage and just wishing us good luck up there and you wouldn't think that someone of harry's like stature would do that but he just was always always nicest most sincere person yeah he just seems like a nice human being he really like is. every interview it's just like and so it's so cool and then that makes me like the music even more because i yeah. feel like when it's like i like the music already oh you're a decent human yeah oh, sweet it's oh, just yeah. like i love it even more and that's uh, maybe that's what also creates that sort of like wild kind of <laughs> like earth shattering screams because it's just like awesome music awesome person oh yeah what's yeah. not to like yeah. no he's he's the uh yeah, I, mean, I kind of came away from that tour, you know, just he's the real deal. He's a uh, great showman, great songs, great singer. I mean, it's just there's 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 no faking it going on there. It's it's absolutely, absolutely real. Now, with all those things that you've done, you know, all those things that you mentioned, did you find that you're playing like you started to think of new things and new ways of like, you know, writing and thinking about your parts because at first you know when you joined they were kind of like hey just do your thing well yeah <laughs> well, like, well, yeah, th things definitely change i mean after like once the record came out casey was like you know she wanted she wanted to recreate that record pretty pretty accurately live 
So the reins definitely got tightened in a little bit. And, you know, I had to, you, you want to, you want to kind of showcase that product and have that consistency every night. So I kind of dialed my parts in. everything wasn't like to a T like it per se is on the record, but it's, you know, there's some interpretations of stuff that how I, I might play it just to give it a little extra sizzle or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but for the most part. But the bones of what you were doing, you yeah. kind of kept in. But then the dressing kind of mm-hmm. looks a little bit different. Right. A li- kind of like, you know, what you feel, but it still has yeah. that record feel that it's not yeah, yeah, yeah. wildly insane. Yeah, th- yeah. I, th- I think when the record kind of came out, you know, there was, there, was the, there was always a little bit of like push-pull between like mm-hmm. my parts and Casey wanting to hear a little something. And so that just, you know, that, that kind of came with in time of like figuring out, you know, each, you know, each other's personalities and like how, how to kind of uh, play it, but also keep it true to the record to a certain level there. So you can rehearse and I try some stuff out. She's like, that's cool. I like that. So I'd try to put that in memory bank and keep that, keep those things in the parts. You know, there was something she didn't like if I was playing too much. I'd try to dial it back or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's but like I, those little mental notes for yourself. And yeah. Just like, oh, she likes that. It's cool. It's, it's easy with. to <clears throat> kind of get a little excited when the songs kind of come out because they're like, oh, there's so many amazing possibilities to do some stuff here. But yeah. <laughs> sometimes you got to stop yourself and be like, maybe I'll try those when they're, you know, maybe these days it would be the appropriate time to try it because we play these songs for two years now or three years, whatever it's been. Yeah. And so then <clears throat> I, I, I saw an article, I think it is, where, you you know, one of the things that you'd love to do is to make, a, you know, an instrumental record. Is that have you like toyed <laughs> around with that idea? And like, you know, you know I, with I, lockdown, I started. Yeah, well, I started the year off. It was like I was kind of picking some songs out and actually going through the yeah. songs. And then for some reason or another, I just kind of lost lost traction on it for the time being. But um, it's it's still there simmering on the back burner, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I was kind of doing some Instagram posts there, just kind of tinkering with some songs and stuff like that. But I, th- I think I need to take a couple Adderall or something like that and just knock <laughs> the thing out in 48 hours. <laughs> I bet you could. So yeah. you have like your own ho- home studio set up right now? You probably, uh, of course you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I kind of want to, you know, I definitely want to be able to like pick the players that I, that I want on this sort of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, all, all my favorite steel records, steel instrumental records, you know, they always have the really good organic band you know just like laying it down and that's kind of what i want i don't want i don't really want some like electronic drums or something like that you know (laughs) you don't want logic drums on there we can just throw that on master it's all good but dude that sounds so exciting like that that would be really cool i mean your entire story i mean from going from playing a gig at an indian restaurant <laughs> and to everything that you said right there is yeah. to me <clears throat> it's so cool to hear that you followed a thing that you were like i need to go here and do this and i don't know what it's going to look like but all these things that slowly open for you and then eventually yeah. all these stories are uh, i mean i appreciate you taking the time in and just like sharing your point of view because this was this is so cool the people that you got to play and i'm looking forward to just seeing all the other things that you're gonna do because they're probably gonna be really kick ass yeah like i said i'm trying to stay upbeat and optimistic you know it's kind of uh, the one thing i've kind of struggled with through this pandemic is just like I always feel like I have something on my plate, like a show coming up. And so you're all, you know, mm-hmm. when I do a weekly show, well, at this bar, I do, I've been doing it for like seven years now. It's this little trailer called Santa's pub. Mm-hmm. It's kind of famous actually. It's kind of like a famous dive karaoke bar, but uh, I've been playing honky tonk music there since, I don't know, seven years ago, whatever that was now. <laughs> <laughs> But they've been shut down during the pandemic. So at the very least, I'd always have something to prep for for that gig if I was in town, you know. Yeah. So I miss doing that. I miss, uh, you know, it's just kind of like just trying to keep yourself motivated during this time. Because sometimes music just doesn't even seem that exciting if you don't have anyone to play for, you know. Yeah. But it, it will eventually. Yeah. Things will open up. And when they do... I feel like you're going to be, you'll just have a host of other really cool stories <laughs> so, <laughs> that will just be amazing. Yeah. And maybe Chris Christopherson will be in one of them again. And just so you look over and it's like, he's there. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's hard to say like what this next chapter with Casey is, is gonna, 
what it's going to look like. You know, I, I haven't really heard any of the, of what she might be working on yet. So, but I know there's, I know there's some songs out there that, that they, they've been kind of, she's been writing during this, this time. So it's, I'm sure whatever it is, it's going to be, uh, I'm sure there's going to be some, some great stories and great times to be had, you know? So. Dude, I look forward to it. And Brett, thank you for taking the time to just talk today. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. What I love about Brett's story is he chased after his curiosity, even when he didn't know what the thing was going to look like. He refused to let fear drive his decisions. If you're listening to this, you probably have a curiosity with songwriting. But if you're like most songwriting guitarists, you have limitations. There's only so many things you can unlock with your guitar. That's why I created the Songwriting for Guitar Insiders Group. Every month, I give you a new skill building module, how to get creative strumming patterns. How do you write that perfect chord progression to an already pre-existing melody? You'll get helpful feedback, plus you'll be able to connect with other potential collaborators. All you gotta do is just go to songwritingforguitar.com and click the Insiders button. All right, that does it for this week's episode. It was edited and produced by the amazing Chris Fafalius. I'm Mike Myers. Until next time.